back on Fictional Frontiers with Sohave. What makes for a story worth telling? For decades, many lamented the perceived notion that cartoons based on toys were simply long-form commercials. And yet, as evidenced by rows of unsold toys based on film and TV shows, children are not lemmings beholden to capitalism. My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, the Hub and Hasbro Studios smash hit is case in point. A series based on an 80s toy franchise that has crossed all bounds because of the integrity of its creators. Jason Thiessen, the supervising director of My Little Pony, is here to chat about the real magic behind the series. Jason, thanks for taking the time, and welcome to Fictional Frontiers. Hi, it's Wilka. Thanks for having me on. And Jason, your road to My Little Pony on the surface, it seems as if you've been ready for this for quite some time, and yet I would hazard a guess that you probably had some trepidation going in, right? Uh, well, yeah. Um, well, when I first heard about My Little Pony, I had probably the same reaction as everybody else, like, oh, it's going to be a little girl show. Okay, well, <laughs> I guess I can work with that. And then, um, and then when I saw the source material and uh, the fact that Lauren was a part of it, mm-hmm. the reimagining, I was like, oh, oh, this could be really good. Um, hearing the chance to work with Lauren was was a huge uh, a huge thing, um, and then yeah, seeing her seeing her uh, her development material was like, oh okay, this is cool. I think this could be really good. And Jason, given the success of the toy line, I know with franchises like these, you have to be very careful. They're not going to give you carte blanche with respect to artistic freedom. So, were there any parameters set? I know it's not Adventure Time with Finn and Jake, but you have had a lot of freedom, though. Well, I mean, yeah, I've, I've worked with, you know, shows for for kids and, and even for girls with, you know, Puka was a bit of a girl's line when I was directing that. Um, and, you know, for that age group and stuff. So I, I understand the, the limitations uh, associated with that. So I was used to that. It wasn't anything new for me. Um, but I think Lauren kind of paved the way for a lot of that stuff. And when she was showing us what we could do and like oh you can do this and this and we're like oh hey look we can you know push things a bit she was she was trying to kind of break us out of of what we thought the show could be mm-hmm. and in a way like because because she was kind of breaking the boundaries there ahead of time and so she was letting us go like no no you can do it you can do it oh okay cool and then um yeah it, it was good that uh, there was that balance. I mean, we get we get notes from from Hasbro, like, okay, this is too much, or or whatnot. So, um, the, but the limitations were uh, reasonable. And you're talking about Lauren Foss, the uh, developer of the show. How did that relationship yeah. develop? Um, well, I mean, uh, it was it was pretty instant. I mean, she she came up to Vancouver and and had a look at what we were doing with um, with the test. Um, when we were sort of doing some animation tests and stuff, and um, she was really nice, and and we had a lot of fun, and she was really easy to get along with, and uh, felt like we had a, a kind of similar sensibilities and stuff. So it was a great, just a great reaction right away. You know, uh, it was kind of instant, I think. And the success of the show, it's it's been stunning on so many levels. I'm sure a lot of our listeners want to know about this iteration. So give us an overview of what this show is all about and how it differs from previous incarnations. Right. Um, well, I don't really know a whole lot about the previous incarnations, but uh, this one particularly uh, follows six main pony friends uh, living in Ponyville. Um, and uh, they kind of, it's the show about how they interact with each other and their friendships um, and problems that arise with their relationships with each other and how they each grow um, with within that um and uh, they're kind of unofficially led by this one pony twilight sparkle who is a unicorn from this capital city called canterlot and she has a special talent for magic and she's sort of like um she's like the the prodigy the magical prodigy and uh, she's sent to can to um to ponyville to kind of learn about friendships because she's mm-hmm. she's too much about her studies and she needs to have that balance in her life um and she's uh She's a, a student of Princess Celestia, who is this, the ruler of all of Equestria, which is like the, the world they live in. Um, and uh, she and the, and the friends that she learns to, that she, that she gets in Canterl, or in, sorry, in Ponyville, um, she finds are like 
special to her in this in this greater sense of like these elements of harmony, and each one of them represents a different element. And when they're all brought together, they they have this um, great power within them. And this that's sort of the theme of the whole series is this, this the power of friendship, the magic of friendship. Um, and it, you know, on the surface, when you say it like that, it sounds kind of like, but the way it's presented, I think, is it just blows everybody away because um, it's not what you expect. Well, there's such a lack of cynicism. There's honest discussion, and you've been praised by fans and critics uh, because of that. How gratifying has that been to get the praise from critics and fans to have them recognize the series as something that can be enjoyed by the entire family? Oh, it's. It's huge. Um, it's really, really awesome because, you know, when you're when you're making a show before it's aired, you you do your best to to make it as entertaining as you can, but you really don't know how people are going to perceive it. You know, maybe it'll just go on TV and no one will really mention it or or what. But um, it's every kind of animator or director's dream to to get that kind of mm-hmm. recognition and. You know, the stuff you specifically put in and like, oh, this is a joke that I really like. And then other people are, are seeing that and they're loving it too. And you go, oh, hey, like, uh, it's working, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they're being entertained and they like it. They're recognizing our hard work. And, uh, yeah, how could you not love that? It's, it's awesome. And Jason, going back to the themes addressed on this show, do you feel that you have a sense of responsibility given the fact that so many families are watching My Little Pony? Yeah, um, I mean, that was that was sort of the setup of the series coming in, um, but I do feel like becoming a part of it that, that, yeah, I feel a sense of responsibility. Like, I want the the episodes to have an importance to the characters and how they grow from the experience and, and uh, you know, and then th- that the lesson that they learn is applicable to everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, you can see an episode about Applejack and something that she has to get over um, and then ultimately, like, you know, conquers some sort of demon that people can go, like, you know what, I, I have a friend like that too or I went through that sort of thing. And I think people can really uh, connect with that better um, if it's something truly sincere. How much effort went into creating a very unique artistic vibe for the show and did you try to stay away from other shows of this time? So we don't want to be like, uh, you know, shows on other networks. We're going to create our own voice artistically, and it's going to be seen, uh, you know, as that, not something that's uh, copycat in any way, form, or fashion. Right. Well, yeah, a lot of work did go into that. I mean, we didn't specifically set out to not copycat anything, but um, I think that maybe is why it is a bit unique, because we weren't really you know, parodying anything. We're just going, like, well, how can we tell this story with, with you know, in, in the way we want to? Um, and then working with the designs and, and everything and, and working with Flash. Um, I mean, I think my experience with, with using programs like that, Flash and stuff, we've learned a lot of tricks and how to achieve that smooth, flowing animation. Um, and just going for it. Sometimes, you know, things that people go, you can't do that. I'm like, well, let's let's work so that we can, you know, find ways around it. And there's a lot of work also into, like, keeping that pace fast, but also giving you some, like, you know, slow points. Mm-hmm. It's like a, I, I, I like to see a story like a, like a roller coaster ride, you know. You build up to something, <laughs> and then it takes you for a ride, and then you have a little break, and, you know, it's got to be that kind of, like, a ride. Um, and if it's, if it's too staccato or too, you know, straightforward or, or too much all at once, for, you know, you, it gets kind of dull. Like, you, you become blind to it all, like an like a, a endless battle scene, you know. You've got to have those ups and downs. I think that's really important. Oh, yeah. A lot of work goes into timing that all out and, and making it feel like it flows evenly. Jason, you know I'm going to ask you about the bronies. I have to ask you about them because... I guess, in a sense, it's almost an organic result of not making the show too girly. So, talk about them and how this—I guess you could say—phenomena developed. The Bronies, yeah, that was something uh, very unexpected. Um, it, I think, who are they? They're they're like everybody that was not intended to be a fan of the show. I'd say. Mm. Because, like, we were, early on when the show was first being aired and, you know, I was like, 
getting out there and, and looking at it. Did anybody pay attention? Did anyone see it? And all that, looking online for uh, reactions. I was seeing, you know, some reactions, and now I'm starting to see people, like, identifying themselves as guys. Like, I'm a 20-year-old male, and I'm not homosexual, and I really like this <laughs> show. What's wrong with me? <laughs> like, they, they were surprised themselves that they were into it. And I was like, well, that was kind of an, an honor that, you know, even people, like, guys like me could could enjoy the show and then that just started building and building and building until you know at some point they got to know each other and and then started naming themselves and uh, I think to me the bro pony brony makes sense I don't know how that's the exact way that that word came about but it makes sense to me because um, it's such a unique thing that such a such a girl's property would be so beloved by adult males <laughs> that they would have to form a word for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel that this show is a response to critics who rail against toy-centric children's programming? You've really proven them wrong? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, it was Lauren who initiated all of that. I mean, And also, you know, Hasbro and the Hub Network for recognizing, the, to, to, to reimagine this property for today's audience. You know, they're it had to be different, you know, um, and uh, and to bring in Lauren and to follow with what she wanted to do um, was, you know, I think it was brilliant, you know, like, and what an unexpected turn. Like, no one ever saw this coming. Like, something like My Little Pony. <laughs> what? <laughs> and, uh, like, I saw some article somewhere that, that uh, the property had no business being good. Mm. You know, like, no one ever would have ever given it a second thought, but, you know, to turn that around, turn it on its head, and just say, hey, you know what, just because My Little Pony doesn't mean that it can't be award-winning, well, hopefully <laughs> award-winning <laughs> entertainment, um, I don't want to speak too soon. Maybe you know <laughs> something we don't. <laughs> no, I don't. I, know, I, I don't. I just, maybe it's wishful thinking. But, um, but, you know, like, and why not, you know, like, uh it's it's the source materials commercial and 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 all that but entertainment is entertainment and it should come from the heart and it should come from a genuine sincere place and you know you can have cynicism I mean we have plenty of cynical characters in the show but you know uh, I think that it's it it is possible and I think that this should happen more you know if they reimagine another show another property I would hope that they would you know maybe take a little cue from what we were able to mm -hmm. achieve and uh, and try to, you know, get someone with a true creative vision and and a sincere, you know, without copying. Of course, no one wants to copy that much. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and, and allow that, that creative energy to flow and, and let it happen. I think that's what Hasbro and the Hub has done really, really well, is allowed us to, to really see our vision through um, to the best that we can. And, uh, I mean, of course, there's, there's mandates from, you know, a brand perspective and, and, and whatnot. But, you know, within that, working within those boundaries, we, we can tell our story, you know, and that's, that's awesome.